welcome to the Monday edition of Dividend Cafe. I am your host, David Bonson, and I am so excited to be in our Newport Beach studio uh, in our offices here. It's been quite a while. I've been on the East Coast. I'm here in Newport for a couple of weeks, and I think we have a pretty full Dividend Cafe. I'm rather proud of what I've written in here over the weekend. I will start with the same caveat, though. It's a very odd day, and I'm somewhat critical of this. When the stock market is open and the bond market is closed, and I would add the banking um, system is closed as well. So you effectively have a government holiday where the stock market is open. It only happens twice a year. I think there is a risk to it. I don't think it's substantial. I don't think there's any catastrophes that we can document that have come from it. But I think that there is marginal distortion that comes when multi-asset players are only able to trade in equity and not in interest rates or in bonds or in fixed income that, you know, inter is kind of interchangeable and 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 within the full context of different portfolio activity. You you there's actors who are hedging. And just different trades get put on differently. Different trades don't get put on that otherwise would. It's, it's just something is not totally right or normal about it. And so all that to say, um, it was one of those days today. Now, the Dow opened up today down 100 points and then began rising almost immediately and ended up closing the day up 200 points. But really, one after the drop at the open, for the next two and a half hours, it just climbed right higher. And then for the remainder of the day, it kind of just flatlined up around that plus 200 level. It didn't close really all that far off of its high on the day. Uh, S&P, so that's about half a percentage point for the Dow. The S&P was up about three quarters of a percentage point. NASDAQ, a little more than that. Um, look, there was a big rally on Friday as well. And you saw a breadth that was pretty impressive with the S&P. Five to one advances decliners, advancers to decliners. Uh, but the Russell 2000, which is the small cap equity index, had basically nine to one breadth, which is really unheard of. I mean, very, very strong uh, advanced decline action in the small cap index. So, again, just an overall um, positive environment for risk assets. The 10-year today closed at 4.09% because that's where it closed Friday. And I just got done telling you that the bond market was closed today. So the top performing sector today was technology at 1.36% and utilities right behind it at 1.3%. Then the worst performing sector was technically down. So you didn't get an 11 for 11 positive, but energy was down 0.1%, so barely down. And it was the only negative performing sector. Uh, the Dow closing today at another all-time high. Um, so let me just go through our normal categories from public policy to economic data to uh, the Fed and all the things. Um, first of all, on the whole, well, okay, let me start over. The uh, personnel is policy point I made a number of weeks back when I did our special edition election issue. Uh, the Treasury Secretary and the people that staff a Treasury Department are going to matter regardless of who wins the presidency. And one thing that I would say is going to be quite important will be the way in which they think about the structure of the debt. The Treasury Department doesn't have a lot to do with how much money gets borrowed because Congress spends money and Treasury has to figure out a way to pay for it. And, that, and you're really talking about the legislator who's spending money. What the Treasury Department has a lot to do with is how the debt that is taken on to meet the level of spending that is being required by the legislator, which is really uh, the, the spokespeople, the spokesmen and women for the people. Um, the Treasury Department has a lot to do with is how the debt gets structured. And like, for example, right now, 90 percent of our debt is at a fixed rate and only about 10 percent is at a variable rate. And most of that, not quite all, but most it, of the floating, uh, the variable is in what we call TIPS, Treasury Inflation Protected Securities, where the amount of money that it costs uh, to borrow is variable around where the inflation rate goes. It fluctuates. And I think TIPS are one of the greatest economic inventions and in financial markets ever concocted. 
but it's it represents a big dollar amount of activity, uh, a couple trillion dollars, but it isn't a huge percentage of federal borrowings. Now, when you look at the 90 percent, um, 22 percent are in what's called T-bills, which are very, very short term. So those rates are constantly resetting. But then 50 percent are in what's called uh, T bond, excuse me, T, uh, I say this backwards all the time, um, uh, treasury notes, where the maturities are about two to 10 years, so kind of more intermediate term. And it is only 16% of total federal debt that is in a locked rate that is longer term, 10 plus. So those 20 year maturities, those 30 year maturities is only 16% of total debt. And I think this is suboptimal. I think it'd be much better uh, even if part, portion of the debt uh, was locked at a high, slightly higher borrowing cost to, for financial markets to know it was fixed and that there wasn't a constant resetting of, of debt that was at a higher price. Now, I say all that knowing that the Fed is in the midst of cutting the short-term rate, and this is one of the biggest things that's going to move the deficit down next year, is depending on how quickly they lower rates and how much they lower rates, Having that amount of money that is two years and less in maturity means that there's a, a significant amount that could very well end up being rolled over into lower than the price it is now. And so that may be the whole point here as to why rates are coming lower is to reduce some of that deficit pressure. Uh, it's certainly a big part of what I believe their calculus to be. Um, just kind of interesting comment on the uh, 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 tribalization in our political atmosphere that I talk about a lot. Um, I found this data point to be quite interesting as we get closer to the election, that there were seven states in 1996 where the outcome of president was 20 percentage points apart um, or more. There were 19 states like that um, in 2020. So uh, so many of the blue states have gotten bluer and so many of the red states have gotten redder that it has made these battleground states the real crux of where elections are determined. Those happen to be so tight that that's where you get this. But again, just having... Um, not merely that there are certain red states that are clearly going to go red or blue, they're going to go blue, but that they are going to go by such a wide margin changes the need for campaigning there, for policies that make sense across the board. It limits the kind of national political spectrum in a way that you, we should not be surprised to exacerbate some of the tribalization. On the economic front, um, the PPI number came out on Friday, and it was unchanged, 0% move in producer prices month over month. Year over year, it's down to just 1.8%. But again, I want to keep pointing out that intermediate processed goods and um, unprocessed goods are at outright deflation. Intermediate unprocessed goods uh, prices are down 9.5% from where they were a year ago, uh, processed down 27 So in, in, core, in, in goods for consumers, and in uh, producer prices of processed and unprocessed goods, we are basically at 0% or less uh, inflation in, into outright deflation. It's, of course, services, housing, messing stuff up. Uh, a very interesting um, data point to share, household debt relative to uh, income, to disposable income, was about 138% pre-financial crisis. It's at 90% now. So the household sectors have all delevered quite a bit since financial crisis. We know what kind of a, a bubblicious environment it was for households uh, before the crisis. Um, but then, of course, the the household uh, sector delevered while the government level relevered and then some. And so you've just sort of switched places in the that amount of financial leverage. It, the actor holding it moved from the household to the government. Uh, then anecdotally, Broadway show attendance is now tracking back to 2019 levels with uh, the highest ticket prices they've ever had. And yet the, the attendance is well above the 2022 and 2023 level back to pre-COVID. 
Um, obviously, 2020 and 21 were out through the, the lock closings and lockdowns and all that. Um, an interesting point to make on housing. I am one who does not believe rates need to go down to the 2 3 4% they were to start to get activity going again, but that they're not likely to uh, produce uh, unthawing of the housing market still above 6%. And so there's some threshold at which I believe sellers start being willing to move. Um, the Fannie Mae uh, uh, projections that came out indicate that they see rates staying uh, into the fives um, into uh, all through 2025 and even in early 2026. So we may be a year, year and a half away till you start seeing mortgages in the 4%. And, and some thawing of the market. I don't know that it'll take that long and I don't know what it will take to get sellers to start moving, but there's very limited activity. Rates are not gonna come down violently in the housing market and it's important to note. Right now, quarter point cut next month is 90% expected. A quarter point cut the month after that is 84% expected. The idea of two half point cuts is at 0%. The idea of two 0% cuts is at 0%. So we're kind of in the middle there, a quarter point at both meetings in the Fed, for the Fed. Oil down 2% today, closing back down to $74. Lower, uh, excuse me, higher than the low 70s it had been in, but higher than the high 70s it had been in. Um, OPEC reduced their forecast for current oil demand, uh, expecting oil consumption to be, um, again, it's still 1.9% higher from prior levels, but that, that rate of growth has come down three months in a row in OPEC productions. Big week again last week for the whole energy sector. Oil was up, energy stocks were up, midstream up another 1.5%. Please, please, please read DividendCafe.com today, the Monday edition for the Ask TBG about the yield curve and recessions, and the Ask TBG about against doomsdayism with two links that I absolutely love. Uh, so, so happy to be with you here from Newport Beach. Uh, reach out with any questions anytime. Questions at thebonsongroup.com. Very uh, much look forward to the big week ahead as we are coming now here into the middle of October. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. Thank you for reading The Dividend Cafe. Mm -hmm.